Dave Hughes here. And joining us on the guest line now, the chairman of the Mississippi Workers' Compensation Commission, Mark Formby, on this Tuesday. Mark, thanks for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing well, Dave. Thank you very much. I'm just de- dealing with the virus like everyone else is dealing with the virus. Well, and that's that's probably the first question that I had for you, which is uh, how has it affected you guys? What, what What's different about what's going on at the Workers' Comp Commission? Well, you know, we're like every other state agency, every other business. We've had to we've had to limit the exposure to our employees and to the people that we serve. So we shut the building down uh, a couple of months ago to uh, outside traffic. Uh, we have a um, process in the building where when you walk in, you 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 begin the purification process, and that's all the way to your desk as you touch doorknobs and that sort of thing. Uh, we um, put some folks on administrative leave, and then we um, everyone else is working three two. So that we we have a lot of cubicles, so we have people that share cubicles. So we tried to limit those to one person per cubicle, and a lot of us are just learning to work from home. Uh, but it appears to be working very well. Um, I think in some ways, uh, you know, we're take we're still taking cases, but we take them in drop offs or mail ins or. Uh, digital settlements, you know, electronic settlements, and we still look at settlements. And I think the lack of traffic in the building is probably making us more efficient instead of less efficient. We're turning out, we're turning out work um, um, at or 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 better than the normal schedule. Well, and that that's the question, and I've had that question for a while regarding this entire situation. I'm curious to see what it's going to lead to. Can, can you see continuing some of these policies if it's turning out to be more efficient and you're getting more work done? Uh, e- even when the restrictions are lifted, can you see keeping some of these things around in some form just, just for that reason? Well, I'm going to scare some of the attorneys that are listening to this to death probably, but yes. Um, you know, there is a value, Dave, to face-to-face. There's a value to seeing the clients that come in, I mean, the injured workers that come in. Uh, there's a, there is a value to having a... Um, an understanding of who the attorneys are and how they function as individuals because we're all different. So all that, you know, that's valuable. But when you begin to weigh that against uh, the value of the social relationships versus the value of getting the work done quickly and getting it out, um, we will probably metamorphosis into some, some, you know, what we're doing today, what we did yesterday, and what we're going to do tomorrow scenario. Uh, but, yes, we're, looking, we're going to look at everything. Well, and that's not surprising to me because I had a suspicion from the word go that some organizations, some departments like yours, some businesses would find out after being forced to take these measures that it turns out it works just as well, if not better, than the way we were doing things before, which could ultimately be a good thing that comes out of all this, I think. Well, you know, I come from a real estate background. I actually still have a real estate company, and when I first got here, uh, I found out that something as simple as DocuSign was not used in this building. It took a year and a half to finally get where we could do digital signatures on certain paperwork. Uh, when I decided to do that in my real estate company years ago, it took 45 minutes. So it does take, you know, sometimes it takes a blow over the head um, for us to react but certainly in a day of digital technology and Zoom and FaceTime and social media, um, we can see each other, we can talk to each other and uh, get questions answered. And so, um, so yeah, I, I think I, there, there will be some, there will be some, probably some loss of uh, individual rights and, and responsibilities that come out of this, but I also think that there will be some awakening maybe in state government as to better, uh, better ways to do our job and do it more efficiently. You know, the workers' comp is something everybody's familiar with the term, but I'm not sure they they have a deep understanding of it. So let's drop back just a bit or, or drop down because we've been talking about the overall process and how it works. What is the process? What do you guys even do over there? <laughs> um, you know, um, it, it, you're absolutely right. That pe- people that are covered by workers' comp, in many cases, do not know what it is. So it's it's kind of a simple thing. Uh, at some point in the past, about 1940s, um, you know, if an employee would get hurt, they get sent home, they wouldn't get paid, they wouldn't get medical leave, they'd sue their employer. They may win, they may lose, but someone decided that uh, it was time to try to uh, 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 come up with a remedy, and the remedy was a insurance program. It's called workers' compensation insurance. 
And what it, it, it does two things. Uh, it, it ensures that the employee gets immediate medical att- attention. Like that day, you go to your manager, you say, I'm hurt, they send you to the ER or their clinical site. And then if necessary, if you're out of work, then workers comp provides long-term compensation or short-term compensation. Uh, if you're killed on the job, it pays death benefits, but it's it's not your normal health insurance program. And obviously, a lot of companies provide health insurance, so you have that. And then you have the workers' comp coverage as a backup. Uh, it's called the grand bargain because there's a flip side. And the flip side says that while the policy um, or, the, or the coverage is fairly liberal as to how you get hurt and that sort of thing, uh, you can't sue the employer. And the employer has to take care of you uh, if the work, if the injury is at work and causally related to your job. And again, pretty broad uh, in the way they interpret that. Uh, the give give philosophy behind the act is you can't sue the employer, and the employer is mandated to take care of you. Uh, and if you work for a company or own a company with more than five employees in Mississippi, then it's required by law that you carry a workers' comp policy. Um, ultimately, you know, there's no copay. There's no. Um, um, there's, there's just there's no nothing. It's, it is a full policy, full coverage. And if if you if the law says you're covered, then you should be taken care of to the limits of the law. And it, it's not all. It, it, you know, there's some nuances to all of that. But that's basic. That's kind of that's that's. I think that's a, an oversight, uh, an overview that most people understand. Well, and now that of course leads into the big question because it ties the first two topics together quite well. Uh, the the current pandemic situation with COVID nineteen with the coronavirus uh, is that covered by workers comp? Uh, that's that's the question we get the most right now. Uh, it's the huge question of the day across the entire nation. Um, so you know the the general answer would be that it is not. And again, you know that's not tipping my hand. That's just based on um, on historical precedent. Generally speaking, community diseases are not considered work-related injuries. The flu, the measles, uh, viral or bacterial infections uh, have not been covered because you could pick them up at the grocery store on the way to work. You could pick them up off a gas pump. So it's hard to tell uh, if, if one actually got the disease at work. Uh, under the current law, uh, it would appear that COVID-19, like the bird flu and all, those, all of its predecessors, would not be covered. Um, uh, I, I asked that, did ask that question. There are some occupational diseases, you know, that we've all heard of, uh, that over time it has been proven that they were work related or environmentally, you know, due, due to work environment. Uh, and that could range from things like lung issues in, in, um, the coal mines to brain injuries in professional athletes. And but it took either acts of legislatures or acts of courts to decide that those particular injuries, um, you know, while they were long term and could be from an outside source, were considered work related. Now, of course, it's hard to talk in generalities because every single situation is different. It's its own situation and has to be judged on its own merits. But as as a general rule. Uh, does the employer's liability figure into this in regards to did they take the necessary steps and and follow the the guidelines that were outlined by the governor for their business? Uh, w- would that play any part into the eligibility of a worker if they contract this virus? Well, you know, you just when you you start off by saying it's broad, it is broad and it is undefined. Uh, obviously, you know, if, uh, if the first thing that would have to be considered, you know, is, I mean, one of the things that we're dealing with right now is just work-related injuries, period. If you are, if you are on administrative leave and not working and you are at home but getting paid, you may not be covered. But if you are at home as a, as an essential employee working from home, and you have an accident, then you may or may not, depending on how. So, so it certainly is broad as general. Uh, employers certainly, you know, this is like every other um, every other work related issue. They certainly need to be in compliance with the the, the current rules, regs uh, under the emergency, because if not, they do open themselves up in some way. Um, but um, um, as far as you know, the specific you know coverage. Uh, that would be kind of on a case-by-case basis. 
Yeah, a worker, a worker, a worker. They could, yeah, they you can file, you can file anything that's work related injury. You have all done. God, this is what I got, and, it, and the work caused it. Uh, then the process begins. Yeah, of course. If you hurt your foot by dropping the bowling ball on it while you were trying to get ten frames in during lunch, it's probably going to be turned down. I'm just saying. We're up against a break. Uh, when we come back, if you can stick around, Mark, I want to keep talking about this. We've got some questions on the C Spire text line about it. Six zero one eight seven nine four three nine five. If you have a question, we'll pass it along to Mark Formby with the Mississippi Workers' Compensation Commission. We'll continue the conversation. Next. Mark Formby, chairman of the Mississippi Workers' Compensation Commission. And we've got a question. Uh, you answered this, but I want to get you to re-answer it just to clarify this uh, so they'll know for sure. On the C Spire text line said, how many employees is required again? I have five, and I'm paying for workers' comp, so I don't have to? I believe you said five or more, right? No, it's five or more. That, you know, when you get into the code, into the act, there are some variations. If you are the owner of the company, you may or may not be counted in a five-man crew. It, it, it gets into subcontracting. But generally, in Mississippi, if you have the fifth employee, then you need to purchase coverage in most fields. Again, there are some exceptions in agriculture. Um, but I, you know, my answer as, as, as chairman of the commission is, if you're in doubt, call an insurance provider because you do not want to get caught short because you are liable for those injuries, fully liable. And in a death case, that can be a pretty huge liability if you're not carrying comp insurance. And just just out of curiosity, how how expensive is this workers' compensation insurance? Uh, it varies, but you know, considering that there's, there's, that there's no... Um, the front end deductible, and that it is full coverage, and it's immediately you know, immediate. It's res, res, relatively cheap. It's so much per person, depending on the industry. Mississippi, in line with the nation, we fall somewhere right in the middle as far as our cost. Uh, matter of fact, right now we're, we're on the lower side as as, a, as cost per thousand per employee. But again, it, it, it differs depending on whether you're in the construction industry or you are in an administrative assistant sitting at a desk. desk. Which makes sense because the risk is going to be higher, and a higher risk is going to require a higher premium. Right. Well, and one of the things that everyone is looking at now in the industry is, you know, how, how, are, we, are, how are we paying, cover, buying coverage for those people who are specifically sent home or not working and those there are no answers to those questions as of yet we will debate those and come up with answers uh, and that's something that'll have to be sorted out really i guess for next time because and and this is a great example of what we've been talking about this entire pandemic situation has brought up a lot of questions that uh, that not only did no one have the answers to no one knew it was a question until this happened so we're kind of having to feel our way through the dark on this aren't we mark no, that's absolutely correct. But but you know, if, if we do the right thing, and you know, I've always I was taught you know growing up, there's there's no right way to do the wrong thing, and so you do the right thing, then ultimately um, there'll be some pain and suffering through this, and there are certainly some people who are suffering through this. But hopefully that you know we'll learn from it, and on the other side of it, like we said earlier, we'll have more efficient. Um, uh, not just in state government, but, but in, in businesses. You know, there are businesses that that are now doing pickup and drive through that never have before. I think some of them will continue to offer some form of curbside because they they figured out how to do it, and there are lots and lots of people who would you know prefer to pick up meals and go home even before this. So, so yes, we all grow, we all learn uh, if we pay attention and attempt to um, do the right thing in each uh, situation. Oh, you're setting a high bar there, Mark. We got to pay attention. <laughs> Come on, that's not the way we work, Mark. You know that. Well, yeah. The good thing about my my job is that if I don't pay attention, somebody pays attention for me. For me, so if I don't, <laughs> if I'm not on it, I hear from somebody pretty fairly quickly. Now, uh, and we we do have a uh, a comment on the the tax line, which is kind of folded into what you said just a moment ago. Said, <laughs> ask him about the logging industry. It's astronomical talking about the cost, but that goes back to the risk versus premium amount again, doesn't it? That's true, and and it's not really even a debate for now because it's 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 deep. It also goes into whether you are a self insured carrier who you know who puts money aside in order to cover your 
your employees, and some big companies do that, or you could be in a self-insured group, and the loggers are a typical example of someone who did that for years. They all joined together. They all put up money. Then they had some issues. They ended up going not being self-insured anymore. They hired a carrier, but they left a lot of um, um, tail cases that had to be covered, and so they continued to be reassessed to cover those cases probably you know, they, they, I, they, I, I'm, I'm sure that I, I agree with that person. I, mean, I don't know who put it up there, but I absolutely agree. And by the way, that also, you know, that, that presents a learning opportunity for us as we move forward. Now when we uh, certify self-insured, we look at things differently. We also scrutinize the boards more to make sure, more often to make sure that, that they don't get themselves in that bind. And there have been two or three self-insureds that have done that. Uh, there are 115 out there that have not, and three or four, five, just six groups counting the governmental groups that have not. Um, but that's our job, also, by the way. We we look at their annual reports and the quarterly reports, and uh, we tr- we have to um, certify that they uh, have surplus that they need, and that they are that they have the money to cover their workers. And if not, we push them towards. Uh, or encourage them, or at some point we can mandate that they go and buy other coverage other than their uh, self-insured policies. Uh, I may be rambling, but that's kind of the case. No, no, no. It's good information, Mark. We appreciate it. Uh, back back to the, the pandemic situation. Uh, you, you said right now the, the baseline rule is it's not covered if you're at work and you get infected with this because of the, the lack of being able to prove it. Uh, have you seen any movements or heard of anything uh, of, of states taking a move towards making that fall under the umbrella and being covered? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, we have. And, um, and again, I even go back to that. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, it appears historically that a, a virus bacterial or otherwise is not covered. So I'm obviously as a someone who would ultimately rule on that, I, I'm not going to say is or is not, but certainly historically it has not. Now, what other states have done, and there's they were start out three or four, then it's five or six, now it's seven or eight, and they're coming on daily, uh, some by executive order, some by legislative process. Most of these are legislators who have filed bills, but they may or may not even be in session. So, so there's not, you know, there's not any huge uh, um, uh, reality that the laws are changing because, as you know, you follow the legislature here, 3,000 bills are filed and 400 become law. So, so lots of bills are being filed. And what these bills do uh, in these different states, and I have looked at most of them peripherally. I've not dug deep into any of them. But the, the, general, um, the general direction is that they, they are creating a presumption that if you work in a certain occupation that has high exposure, then it would be presumed that if you got the virus that you got it at work, and then the burden of proof would shift to the employer to prove that you did not. Uh, so <clears throat> most of them obviously are talking about um, health care workers and first responders because those are the people who are getting the most exposure and it is mandated by their job. I will say that employee health employees also treat the flu and others and have traditionally for years but have not been covered. They've been covered by their health insurance for that, but not by workers' comp. So even then, it's dicey. Uh, in addition, some of the states that I have looked at have used words like other essential employees. You know, my barber is looking more and more essential every day. <laughs> I, I, we didn't get through the video today, but I'm, I'm, I'm about two months from my Mississippi State ponytail in the day. Um, so and now we now so, we know, by the way, mysteriously the video just wouldn't work. You just answered that question, Mark. Now we know what's going on. No, no I, really, I wore my favorite super talk tie, so no, I, I was prepared to do it. We just couldn't get it on. Uh, but, you know, it, that, it's broad. What is an essential employee? And, um, you know, if, if uh, and I can get all into that because I have my own philosophy on it. Uh, but then others use words like frontline employees. So healthcare workers, first responders, and other frontline employees. So, so you know, it, it could be a slippery slope. It's hard to define. You know, you want to keep the door tight enough uh, that we cover true work-related injuries because the, you ask about the expense, you know, and the, the more exposure you get, then the more the expense is. You mentioned bloggers, contractors, and others who already have um, huge – uh, you know, they they may not have a lot of injuries, but their injuries could be 
severe loss of limb, um, loss of use of whole limbs, you know, quadriplegics and paraplegics. So those are deaths are all huge expenses. So the more you open it up to exposure, the more likely you will have uh, those expenses. And of course, we deal with actuarial numbers where we predict out of the future. And so it can get it can get way out of hand if we decided to go down this road and not go down this road with a tight enough definition. Makes sense. Mark Formby, the chairman of the Mississippi Workers' Compensation Commission. We appreciate your time today, man. Well, I appreciate the being. I think this is the first time you and I have had a chance to talk, so I've enjoyed it immensely. I hope we'll get a lot of calls here. Hopefully your listeners are listening, and hopefully we covered uh, some of their big questions. And um, and if we have not, then you know, we are here, we are available, we serve the public, and we try to answer those questions, especially for employers who are trying to uh, legitimately take care of their workers. Hey, and, and if we get too many of them, uh, we'll just get you back in here and we'll take another go at it. Mark, we appreciate it so much. It's time for a break when we come back. 